Hello, friends, and welcome back to r slash pro revenge. Sometimes it's a bad idea to give your friend your car keys. You'll see why in the first story. Subscribe to our channel if you're new here, and don't forget to turn on notifications so you don't miss a new video every single day. To the story. I parked my friend's car in the sun. I learned to regret it. I live in the desert part of the US and during a few months of the summer it's consistently over 110 degrees, 43.3 for my European bros. I was borrowing my friend's car for a quick drive cause mine was at the shop. He asked me to park it in the shade but I couldn't find a shady spot so I couldn't. So when he went to use his car it was burning hot inside. He went to me and asked why I didn't park it in the shade and I told him I couldn't find any. He told me I would regret it and I thought he was joking. He then offered to pick up my car from the shop. I said yes because I thought he was going to just park it in the sun for a one-time revenge. So I drive a Prius and it uses automatic keys that open it up when you go near it. This will be important later. He parks my car in the sun like I expected and gives me back my keys. I expect this to be the end of it, but no. The next day I went to work and parked in my normal spot in the shade, one of the only shady spots there. After that I walked into work and proceeded as normal. Later I went to find my car during lunch only to see it three spots over in the sun. I thought that it was weird because I remember parking in my normal spot, but maybe I'm just tired and someone was already there in the spot and I'm having a memory lapse. My car being in the sun was burning hot. This continues to happen for like 10 more days until I finally convince myself I'm not crazy. I start thinking, who the F is moving my car? No one has a key but me. Then I remember my friend and what he said. He had to be the one doing this. I talk to him and he smiles. Apparently when he went to pick up my car, he got a new automatic key made for $300 and has been moving my car two to three spots over every day into the sun. Well, let's just say it didn't stop after that. Instead, he did it more. From my apartment to work, he made it his life's duty that summer to make my driving miserable. Also, he stopped and given me back the key because it's winter now. The story's a few months old. He said that one summer was enough pain for my sin. And our next story. I don't have the time and you don't have a job. When I started working for a local council IT support desk in 2005, the standard operating procedure SOP for answering calls is that when the phone rang, we take the user details, their fault description and attempt to fix the issue. This went on for six years until we had a new manager with several innovative ideas which we all knew were not going to work in our particular environment. New manager calls a meeting with the entire team including his own manager and the head of IT. He lays out the new rules and procedures. We stated that his procedures were not going to work because of various other protocols and the distance between sites. No one in authority listened to our concerns. Two main policies were that we divided into three shifts. Morning shift, 7 o'clock to 1500. Day shift, 9 o'clock to 1700. And late shift, 1400 to 2200. And that only the day shift is supposed to spend time fixing the more complex issues. Morning shift and late shift are simply call takers. Call takers had two minutes per call and any breach was brought up at your monthly review. Of all the new policies, the two minutes per call rule was the worst. Not only did we have a mere two minutes to take a call, we had to attempt some troubleshooting and write up all the notes. If this was a new employee, we also had to add their details into the system. Being the most senior support person on the team, I made a mental list of what I could do in that two minutes. It was a small list, but it meant that when the first shift started at 7 a.m., most of the important work could be done. After a month, the department was in chaos. Because we could only work two minutes before handing it off to the day shift, there were a lot of calls for the three day shift workers to attempt to fix. The outstanding queue went from 100 calls to nearly 2,000 in that month. I maximized my time on every call. If I couldn't fix the call, I ensured that every call would take just under the two minute mark, then dump them in the day shift call queue. Dropped calls, people who called and hung up, increased drastically, and one of the team went on a long-term sick leave due to stress. Eventually, the boss decided to come in early and see what the problem was. He sees me and another tech taking calls. He stands over us while we work through the calls. 
We both take less than two minutes per call and follow his rules to the letter. He has no reason to complain, but sees that the calls are dropping. With two people taking calls, two minutes per call, and a peak of 30 calls around the 8.30 a.m. time mean that lots of these calls drop, then call back later. Later in the shift, I see him checking call stats and see his face get red. He knows that his policy is not working. The following day, boss calls us into the meeting room and states that we must work harder or smarter. He tells us that we need to use the on-site support team to handle the logged calls instead of the day shift. We still had the two-minute rule and the same staffing levels. I mentioned a couple of times that VIPs couldn't wait and that we need four people taking calls from 8 a.m. I was told that the rule still stood. The day after, and we find out that on-site support have no free slots for over a week, which is three times shorter than the day shift's waiting times. Boss is in, and instead of logging onto the phone, he's simply floating around. As 8.30 rolls around, I answer yet another call. This is a VIP, the chief executive. He's in a meeting room 70 miles away attempting to turn on his laptop, but he can't get past the encryption software. It's an easy fix, but takes 10 minutes over the phone. I can't do it because of the two-minute rule. I'm torn between dropping the calls or annoying the chief executive. Boss sees me hesitate and asks what's going on. Laptop encryption. He's in distant town. The boss shut me down. Hand it off to the desktop. I told him that they wouldn't be able to get out for over a week and that the day shift could fix it, but this is stopping him from working. Day shift is too busy. I don't care who it is. Hand the call off, he told me before walking off. I took the details and told the chief executive that I'd have to hand the call off, made the notes on the call, and gave the incident reference. I realized that I hadn't told him who it was, but he could get this information easily. I also saved and replayed the recorded conversations to find that my boss could be heard clearly. After lunch, I was called into the office of the head of IT. He chewed me out for leaving the chief executive without saying anything to present the council's vision of the future for distant town. I was told that the chief executive wants someone's head, metaphorically, for the treatment, and that formal proceedings had started, and I was to be suspended on full pay, and did I have anything to add? I told the head of IT that my boss had told me to do it, and when I started to explain about it, he walked away. I also told him that if he pulled my phone log for that call, he could hear the boss saying that I was told to stay in that office while the head of IT checked. An hour later, I was told to go home on full pay and return in the morning. The result was that the new boss was replaced, fired, and a new boss was placed there, promoted internally, actually listened to his staff, and let us suggest improvements. And our last story. Taught a lesson to my idiot boss who tried to get credit and promotion for a software I made and fired me over it. I was working in a finance company last year. One day, I proposed to my manager that since I have a computer programming background, I know that for that manual job XYZ, automation can be done using some new tech and it'll reduce 500 man hours per week. He also has some tech background, so he says it hasn't been done because it can't be done and behaved with condescension. I, being bullheaded and with crap to prove and CV to build, Developed it on my own, in my own time, on my home computer, then compiled it into a binary, single executable file without code, and gave it to him. He got permission from the IT department to run it on his computer and was utterly sure that it wouldn't work and he would get to laugh at me. But it did. Even though the software works, Idiot Manager took it as an insult somehow and banned me from using it giving some inane reason that doing it manually was much more effective, which was a bummer because it was working beautifully. Fast forward a quarter or so, my manager was hard-pressed for some brownie points during appraisal, so in examples of showing initiative, he used my software but without mentioning me. Some super senior manager took notice and gave him a promotion and a raise. Now, instead of being a sensible guy and coming clean to get code from me, he calls me in his cabin, behaves rudely, and says that I need to submit the code for that software. I ask him why. You'd said we won't be using it. He's like, either you submit the code or you'll be fired. I was already fed up of being treated like crap by this crap stain, just because he was somehow jealous. So I said, F off. I won't submit the code. I know enough law to know that you can't sue me, and I resign. I came to know later through my colleagues that this is what he must have wanted. 
so that he could take the entire credit himself without dispute. Little did he know, there was a malicious code module hidden in that executable file, which checked for a 1 or 0 on a remote GitHub repository every time it was run. If 1 or no network, do everything as required. But if a 0 is received, that's emergency signal. I added that little code because his behavior was very crappy to begin with and I didn't trust him. I was planning to remove it after its official implementation, which never happened, so I went ahead and changed that one to a zero after I was fired to ensure no one used it without my permission. Although he couldn't get the code, he did have the executable file, and I was also not in the company anymore, so in his arrogance, he called a meeting with his boss, his colleagues, and my whole team to show them a demo of this awesome software he'd made. He was using it on his laptop every day without my knowledge. But today the one was a zero, so as soon as he pressed enter, nothing happened. Pressed enter again, nada. Suddenly his laptop was frozen and nothing was working anymore. It took him a while to realize something fishy was going on and he took out the laptop battery to switch it off. By then, all the Word, Excel, and PowerPoint files were encrypted and the executable had erased itself out of existence. I used the same code without the malicious module to get a better job at another company where I'm much more appreciated and the job is also fun. Then the whole COVID thing happened and now I'm cozily working from my home. My previous colleagues of that crappy company keep telling me that they're being forced to go to the office. So somehow it was the best decision I'd made accidentally. The idiot boss's promotion and raise got canceled because he couldn't produce what he promised he also got reprimanded for losing a lot of important company data, which he attributed to some unknown virus, which wasn't believable because no one's allowed to put anything on those office laptops without security clearance from the IT department. He called me one night, drunk, angry, threatening me that he knows what I did. I feigned ignorance and quoted something like, crap happens to crappy people, and blocked his number. But I had to tell someone about this flawless victory over stupid without being implicated, so here it is. Hey guys, thank you all for watching the video, and I'll see you in the next one.